Last year, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation announced that the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation companies had exceeded our goal of reducing calories in the marketplace by 400 percent. And many people thought that the industry would leave it at that, and we have it. We're actually excited to start moving on to the next stage. As we move forward, this particular series it will focus on what big barriers there are to industry and the public health sector working together successfully, what are the barriers to progress, and how do we overcome them together. I am very pleased to see so many of our colleagues, many of you who I work with in other capacities here from the public health sector uh, joining us in today. But in particular, I'd actually like to acknowledge the folks that are streaming in from universities and academia from around the United States. Welcome to Georgetown University, George Washington University, American University, Tufts, Cornell, Duke, the University of North Carolina, South Dakota State University, and Johns Hopkins. So we are very excited to have classrooms across America and uh, key academics who are leaders in this field uh, joining us in this particular seminar. We hope you can join us in future seminars and we also look forward to your input as we're developing and enhancing our programming over the next year. I want to thank everybody for coming today. We look forward to working with you in a collaborative effort to finding long-lasting solutions to a very real problem. But now I'd like to turn the program over to Hank Cordella, who is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Hank is going to be moderating this conference series, and uh, we appreciate having Hank and his, uh, his interesting ideas and collaborative uh, forward-thinking uh, approach that Hank has uh, to joining us and bringing you all together. So thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us, especially those of you who had to travel. Uh, the East Coast is feeling more like my uh, former residence in Minnesota lately, but it's nice and warm in here and cozy. And thank you all for joining us uh, with the live stream. Uh, what we're going to do today is really the topic of how industry and the public health community work together and how we make it better and what our barriers are and what we bump up against. Uh, I want to share some unique perspectives, talk about what's working, what's not working, and perhaps insert a little bit of uh, some blasphemy in there uh, to perhaps take it to a different level. Um, my background, in addition to what Lisa mentioned, is I am a product of the food industry with companies like General Mills, Anheuser-Busch, Coke, Nabisco, Cadbury, Schweppes. So I've covered the food pyramid, perhaps from the wrong side, but nevertheless it gives a perspective on what industry thinks and at the same time how we solve some pretty severe uh, problems, such as childhood obesity and getting Americans to eat healthier. So what we want to cover today is basically, I'll give you a little bit of background on the entire session. Uh, series and then uh, want to talk about well the, the collaborations between industry and public health are there any that work pros and cons uh, we have two terrific guests today uh, with Wendy Johnson Askew uh, of Nestle and Richard Black of PepsiCo people who are public health champions who are living inside the wombs of industry. So they have a very unique perspective that they could add to this conversation, seeing both sides of it. And then what we'll do is we'll graduate to some strategies that we believe might be effective as we go forward. So with that as the background, we will have questions and answers. We'll have question and answers after our uh, two guests talk, and then we'll have questions and answers at the very end. So let me just go through a brief introduction here and you say, well, you know, the first question is why? Why do we even care about collaborating with the food industry? And, you know, yes, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get more effective engagement. When the day's done, we're looking to improve public health, okay, and public health outcomes. So that's why we even think about it. And what we'll be doing is over this five-part series, Today's I've mentioned, but what we'll also do is go through a series of hot button, hot topic issues. Uh, one could be, for instance, the whole 
brouhaha surrounding sugar sweetened beverages, artificial sweeteners, et cetera, how we might go about tackling those kind of problems with both bringing both industry and public health perspectives together, running them down the funnel and coming up with some workable and practical solutions that can accrue from that kind of dialogue and that kind of thinking, understanding both sides of the aisle. And then what we're going to do is we'll have a session for industry. And I'm going to be coming back to this audience and those of you on the live stream for input where what do they need to know about the public health community so they can be more effective in addressing your needs and at the same time helping them grow. So that's the nature of our seminar series. And we're excited about it because we're breaking new ground here. And I must acknowledge that we're building off a lot of progress that has occurred just in, in my brief tenure in this space. I've seen a lot of change in just the last uh, two years, and I see it continuing to accelerate. So what can we do as a group here to keep that ball moving? Uh, so let's go through the questions we want to tackle here throughout the day. We only have two hours. It's going to be jammed, so I'll be moving quickly. Uh, why is engagement essential? Okay, why do we care? What are the keys? What makes it work? What makes it work and what can we learn from those that worked? And perhaps what are the behaviors on both sides of the aisles? I always like to draw political analogies and metaphors as we look at Congress and we all take our sides. There's a little bit of that going on here and I think we could learn from that. So again, what works, what doesn't work from those kind of behaviors. And then perhaps more importantly is let's identify some of those key barriers that prevent things and engagement from being a little bit more effective and how we might overcome them. And then finally, let's look at some strategies we could take forward. One of the things I want to provide is assistance with helping the toolkit of the public health community. All right, the broader your toolkit that you have at your disposal in terms of ways to approach issues or tackle problems, uh, I think that really helps you be a lot more effective. So we'll go through that. Now, why do we care? Well, these are big guys. They sell a lot of stuff. They're a two and a half trillion dollar industry. CPG is consumer packaged goods companies. Grocery, restaurants, convenience stores, I mean, there's even some other smaller groups, but you're talking a lot of sales. They are massive, and perhaps just as important is their marketing budgets. You're talking about over $15 billion in marketing spending, and that doesn't even include the spending that you see in stores, okay, uh, for displays or feature ads, things like that. So one of the, the lessons I think we can learn from this, oftentimes it's, this is approached as, look at this, they're, they're so big, they're spending 15 plus billion dollars, what can we do to stop that? And perhaps another way to look at it is, how do we get them to do our heavy lifting for us? Because that's kind of what they do. It's in their DNA. You know, we're marketing people, so you know, we grow our businesses, we spend money. So the key is, we'll talk about some of the dials we could move to see how we can get industry to start leveraging their capabilities, but considering the public health need. So, what's the opportunity? All right, what can they do that we need them or would like them to do? Well, the first thing is their products provide healthier alternatives. I mean, if you look at the products that they have, we're just completing an analysis, a supermarket analysis, and uh, my poor analyst is, is getting uh, dizzy. There's 300,000 individual uh, items that he's analyzing, and it's just massive how many food products are out there. And... So again, they control the spigot. That's one way to look at it. The spigot of products, the spigot of calories, fats, etc. So how do we get them to move? And that's what we're talking about, ways to do that. And at the same time, how do we get them to increase access, availability, distribution of products that are healthier? And also, they are very tight with the consumers. If anyone knows the consumer, it's the marketers. All right, they know them cold. 
So again, how do we piggyback that understanding and that bond they have with their user in ways to communicate and to persuade, to understand things like segmentation, that they understand their consumers much better than we do as a public health perspe uh, perspective. And if we can tap into this, we will have healthier problems and we will lower calories and we will make a dent into America's health. So that's the perspective uh, that I'll bring today when we talk about it. And what I'd like to do is go through some very specific concrete examples and dissect them. What's working, what's not working perhaps. And also we have a, uh, a case study which I'll ask your feedback on and let's have some dialogue on that. So what I'd like to do is tell you what questions we'll explore. We'll look at success stories, why they work, perhaps why they're not working or ways they could be done better, and how you get over these hurdles that we find. So the first one I'd like to talk about is the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation. I mean, not simply because they are part of the sponsorship group here, but also it worked. So let's go through it and find out what happened, what worked, and perhaps some things that might be different. But this was a collaboration. Again, Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation uh, is a group of 16 consumer packaged goods companies, marketers, the largest ones included. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, again, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is a beacon for the public health community. Uh, Indra Nui is the CEO of PepsiCo. She was uh, a driving force behind this kind of change. And of course, you have uh, University of North Carolina, Barry Popkin and his team involved in this. And again, experts in this space and they know the space. So you have a, quite a bit of credibility just going in to this particular initiative. And when you look at these companies, again, these companies account for just in the United States and grocery stores almost $100 billion worth of sales. Thank you. <laughs> so you say, all right, there's a lot of influence here. So if we could get some change out of these companies, you're really starting to make an impact. And then when you look at the results, I want to go through the results and then start dissecting it. Again, the commitment was made over the initial five-year period to take one and a half trillion calories out of the food supply, and lo and behold, they were able to take out 6.4 trillion calories uh, in that initial five-year period, which was ahead of schedule. So you have to say, all right, they not only met their commitment, they well exceeded it by 400%. And then when you start looking at, from a child obesity perspective, what happened to calories being sold in households with children. And again, there was a drop in 66 calories per day per person in that. So again, progress is being made, tangible progress. It doesn't mean there isn't more work to be done, but nevertheless, tangible progress is being made. And then, of course, um, there was a session at the museum uh, with PBS, uh, and Risa and Indra sat down together and recorded a session where both public health and industry sat down and talked about it, talked about what worked, what there's still to do, but at least we now have the two sides sitting together on the same platform talking about something they tackled, what they did, and yet there's still more work to be done. But it's also done in a, in a civil and in a constructive. I like to use the word constructive. It's very important to me. I think that in some quarters has not been utilized enough, either from industry or, or let's say extreme ends of industry or extreme ends of public health. Sometimes it gets destructive and it gets to be hurling bricks at each other. You know, you're bad for doing this. What do you do? You don't know how to run my business. And whether it's true or not to me is, is moot because it doesn't solve any problems. All right, we have to graduate, and we are graduating to more constructive approaches. So let's talk about and pick apart why I believe this particular initiative is effective. The biggie is it was a firm, quantifiable commitment, all right, in terms of what was promised and when it was promised. Okay, so in this case, the original promise was we're going to pluck out a trillion and a half calories 
actually by 2015 was the original promise. Okay, it's tangible, you could track it, you could look at it, and everybody hangs out there knowing that they will be judged on that. Okay, very straightforward. All right, but the most important thing again is it's quantifiable. It's not soft. It's not soft science. It's not like we try, we'll try to take out, okay, no, no, no. This is, we'll take out X calories. All right. Also, there's the potential for industry to succeed, all right, because calories is something that um, they have, again, they control the spigot of what goes in the product. So it was something that at least they had a shot at achieving, all right, as opposed to something if we said, well, you have to take out you know, X trillion grams of saturated fat, they might not be able to do that, or they'd all have, they all have different needs. The calories, they all have as a variable that they can control. It's a win-win. It's definitely a win-win. We're not looking for a bad guy here. Now, if they don't achieve it, let's understand it, what worked, what didn't work, and what I would demand if they didn't achieve it, what's your commitment for the next five years so that you can exceed what you promised, so you can get to that level. And then, then way, this way, you have some progress being made. All the players, credible. You have credible players. You're not looking around saying, well, it's kind of a loosey-goosey confederation. No, these are real players in this space. And it was focused. I really like this aspect of it. I think, and we'll talk about this later, one of, one of the beauties of watching uh, when I um, come together with those in the public health community, I love the ideas. I love the creativity that emanates out of these discussions. And what tends to happen sometimes is that the ideas are so good, there's so many things we wish to accomplish that now from an industry perspective, it gets overwhelming for them. So the more you can drill down to something they could lock into, because that's their headset. They're real good at you know, zeroing in on something and making something happen. So what I liked about this is it's calories, okay? Go for it. And it was only one segment. It was the consumer packaged goods companies. It wasn't trying to get restaurants and bodegas and all these other things involved. Now, let's go get the big guys, the ones that are doing $100 billion in sales. If they do this, you'll take a big chunk because they account for 25% of all the calories that are being sold. Okay, you will make tangible progress. So I really, really like this aspect of it. And I also like the shared ownership, as you saw with the, um, the PBS photo momentarily. All right, they're doing it together. It's not industry saying, hey, look at this, we're great, life's good. No, it's together with Robert Wood Johnson, Healthy Weight Commitment, Indra Nui. That to me is a partnership. And I think when you look at, for instance, the commentary that was written about this um, by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as I look at it, I found it to be very balanced. All right, it's like, hey, they did it. Congrats. All right, now we still have a lot of work to do. All right, we're still trying to tackle childhood obesity. It would be great if we can keep going more. And oh, by the way, it'd be great if we get other sectors to do the same kind of initiative. That's a constructive way to look at what happens here. Um, and I'll talk about ways perhaps not to do that in a later chart. So this is one example that you could use as a case study. The other one I like just from last week is the Partnership for a Healthier America. Uh, they just celebrated last week the fifth anniversary of Partnership for a Healthier America. And again, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is uh, an initiative where the First Lady is the honorary chairperson. And the goal of this group is basically very specifically working with industry to affect positive solutions and directives to deal with the childhood obesity crisis. And they have multiple programs, but this is an interesting one because it has some different elements attached to it as you look at it. What they do is they look to get very specific commitments from individual companies together. They call it an MOU. It's a Memorandum of Understanding. It's used in business deals. So, Let's pay attention to that. They get an MOU right there and then. They're telling you they understand industry language. They don't say, I want a commitment or I want you to sign this 19-page contract. I want an MOU. And by the way, business people like it because they're short. Okay, we, 
coming out of industry, you like short. Short is good. All right, so they get a commitment. All right, they get a third party outsider to validate whether progress is being made, and they report it. They put it in their annual report. And oh, by the way, they get a nice bully pulpit to demonstrate that they're doing something with the White House and Mrs. Obama. And it's very prestigious for them. So again, it's everyone using their tools to make something effective. Now, here's an example. Uh, I just plucked this one out. I mean, Walmart committed in 2011 that they were going to increase the number of stores, either increase or renovate the stores in uh, food deserts, basically. Uh, where they would add fresh grocery, fresh produce in there. Uh, and right now, it's been tracked that they've done about, they're about two-thirds of the way there. So every year you get a number, okay? At the end of five years, they'll hit whatever it is they hit. But at least it's trackable. It's very specific. It's very tangible. So to that point, again, each company makes a commitment, what they're going to do, and it's recorded. And uh, they know, uh, the good news is they get the bully pulpit to, to go brag. On the other hand, if they don't deliver the goods, they get that end of it too. So it's a nice blend of opportunity, but also challenge to these corporations. Um, the commitments they make are achievable. They have to make some effort. I have to tell you, putting uh, stores in food deserts, particularly in urban areas, very challenging for the retailers because they make less money. And in fact, in some cases, their costs are higher. Uh, the real estate is more costly, uh, especially in certain areas. You know, their insurance is higher uh, because of crime. Uh, and when the day's done, their dollars, if you would, they, one of their metrics, and we'll get the metrics later, the, the sales per square foot is lower in these kind of markets. So by itself, that's why all these stores, these big stores are out in the suburbs now because they're, Revenue per square foot is significantly higher out there. So it's, it's simply the numbers, if you would. <laughs> it's not that they don't want to be in, in an inner city. It's just they have trouble making the numbers work. Now, Walmart's a case where they could make it work, all right, because they have critical mass. Their control of the food supply, they keep the cost down so low. They could actually make money, whereas a Kroger might not be able to make money in these kind of locales. So as an example, so again, went for companies, went for public health that they achieved their goals. In this case, the Partnership for a Healthy America actually pulls in a broader array of companies. As you saw from the opening chart on this, uh, you have Nike in there, you have Walmart, you have Walgreens, you have Darden Restaurants, which uh, at one point owned Red Lobster and, and Olive Garden. So they're pulling in a lot. Now, I personally prefer more focus, and I think this is an opportunity as they go forward, perhaps, to focus more on the retail sector, because the packaged goods people seem to be coming along pretty well. But again, they can get away with going more broadly because of that uh, strong, prestigious pulpit they have. And it's a quid pro quo. It's quid pro quo. We pretty much touched on that. And you know, again, it's been used as an example of something that is effective. It gets away from name calling. It gets away from I'm right, you're wrong. Again, going back to the word, it's more constructive rather than destructive. And I think an important element that I didn't note here is this doesn't mean that the public health community has to do what industry wants or kowtow to industry. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is that if you want to get progress out of them, fine, strike those balances between, um, as some among us like to say, the, the carrots and the sticks. All right, strike the balance. Because from an in, if I were still in industry, I mean, I've been out from these big companies for several years. Um, and if I didn't have a personal mission to help people live longer and healthier through food, I might not react the same way as I do today. I react very differently today because I care about achieving both goals. If I were still in the industry, you know, I want to grow my business, but I care about the public health need. In many quarters, they're not rewarded, as we'll show you shortly. And the key is to strike that balance. If, the, if it's always, you did this, you're bad, you didn't achieve this. After a while, I've, in dialogue I've had with many corporations, they just shrug their shoulders and say, you know what, no matter what I do, it doesn't matter. 
somebody is going to find a problem with what I say. So we have to be careful about turning it off because there are opportunities to leverage, again, their capabilities. Now I'd like to use um, the National Restaurant Association Kids Live Well as kind of a case discussion. I want to give you a little background and I'd like a little uh, feedback from you as to what your take is on this particular program and maybe we can have some microphones ready shortly. Um, Kids of Well is a program uh, by the NRA and it's voluntary and again they're trying to offer healthier items for kids and increase consumption of fruits and vegetables and uh, have products that are reduced in sodiums and fats and things like that. All right so that's the essence of the program. Uh, the criteria for participation is four pieces of this. First of all, there needs to be at least one item that's uh, like a meal that's 600 calories or less, and it has other criteria attached to it, you know, like two plus servings of fruits and vegetables, has some fiber, and also has certain reduced amounts of uh, sodium, et cetera. You can see on their web, they do have a website for this that would go through every single one of these. All right. They also ask for a second individual item that's 200 calories or less. And again, similar kinds of criteria surrounding the, um, the nutrient aspect of it. And then they ask for the restaurants to display or make available a nutritional profile. Pay attention to the word upon request, uh, the nutritional profile of the healthful menu options. And then finally, to promote and identify these particular items. Okay, so again, this is the essence of the criteria. I have not edited, I've shortened, but I haven't changed the verbiage, so you can see what they're saying. So, okay, two items, make it available, promote. Okay, so from the participants, and they have 42,000 individual restaurant locations that are participating. So, they have pretty good participation here. And you know, they get put on this uh, Healthy Dining Finders website, and that's a place that would identify restaurants, where you should go for your kids if you want to have better for you products for them. And they will promote this on their sites, and they give them an icon to use. And here's an example. Uh, Chili's has an item, which is a grilled chicken, broccoli, little orange juice that meets all the criteria. So again, it's, this is pretty straightforward kind of item. And again, if we had more items like this, this would be good. All for it. So let's have a discussion. And again, I, I'm going to throw these out. So first question I have, compared to the first two, all right, are the commitments here firm, quantifiable? Does it have enough teeth? Anyone want to make a comment on that? Any uh, feedback on that? Yes. We need the microphone there because uh, we have live streaming. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking compared to the healthier packaged goods where you have an outcome that really seems closer to the consumer behavior. There's these calories that are being taken up by households. That is a real change. This, you put something on a menu one, at least one item, but there could be many other items that are actually selected more. You're offering it, but there's no measure of how often it's served, so you may not have sufficient incentive to really make sure that it's really ap appealing to kids, whether to really encourage its take up. It might be almost a form of, I don't, I don't health washing, to adapt the green washing kind <laughs> term, you know, it's there you have the good PR that you've offered it, but you're not really making much change in consumer behavior. I think that would be the problem with offer as opposed to serve as, as a measure. Okay, yeah, that's a very valid point. I mean, what, what you're saying is, and this is accurate, is that it's not really tangible in a sense, all right? You don't have report cards on this. Uh, you know, as you look through the other questions here, does it really deal with childhood obesity? I think you indirectly got to that issue. And let me ask you, as members of the public health community, is this program credible to the public health community? Do we have any points of view on that? 
Anyone like to add a, a comment on it? That means you all approve it? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I have uh, questions about, you know, you measure quantifiable outcomes of calories and uh, how it relates to obesity. And uh, my concern is that uh, I eat out of whole foods. And when I check out, you know, I check the food of the person that's in front of me. And up in Grover Park Whole Foods, I mean, those foods are healthy. I mean, that is a healthy community because they're high socioeconomic and they have good obesity and uh, the calories are low. But if you get into uh, the low income communities, you're not going to see that kind of consumer behavior. And so, you know, my whole point is it's the discrepancies that we have in terms of healthy behavior, eating behavior between the socioeconomic groups. And if you look at calories, I mean, you're not really going to get a good hard look at the low income groups that live in these food deserts. Well, it's a good point. Uh, I'll answer that briefly and then we'll move it over to Tracy for a question. But uh, one of the things that is being discussed with the packaged goods companies is now that they've taken out a chunk of calories, can they make healthier foods more accessible in the markets where there are food deserts or they're low income? That's a hole right now. They're not doing as good a job in that particular arena. So this goes back to an earlier comment I said, if we ask them to do everything, Got to make it accessible, take all the calories. Oh, by the way, let's pull out all the sodium and all the saturated fats and all the trans fats and all the sugars. That gets overwhelming for them. So you are right. There are problems. Um, although I did just one point to Whole Foods. And again, I admire what Whole Foods does. But I did notice when I was writing my book many years ago when I picked up uh, Palm Wonderful, you know, the pomegranate juice. And I noticed it had 60% more calories than a Coke. So I'm going, all right, well, I guess it's got more nutrients in it, certainly. But uh, So which, where do I win, where do I lose on this? So it creates interesting conundrums for that. But thank you for your question. Tracy, I think you had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Well, just very quickly, in, in terms of how we could add more teeth, I think if we were... Um, the commitment were around sales and um, increasing sales. Um, that would make a big difference. Yeah, sales of healthier products. Right. I would agree. We were channeling one another, seeing that we're in the same row here. Yeah, th there, there are lots of uh, loopholes in the way that particular commitment is phrased. Um, mm -hmm. Offering something, marketing something, making sure it sells, making sure it's affordable as well as healthy. Um, are all really important parts of the end goal. And unlike healthy weight commitment, we didn't see an end goal. We didn't see so as to lower calories consumed or, um, you know, uh, uh, fat, sugar, and excess calories by so much. So it, it, it does seem like a commitment you could drive a truck through. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's, uh, was there any other comments? Did you want to make a comment? Um, yeah, actually, I was going to say, I would see this as a great first step for the restaurant industry, considering where kids' meals have been. Um, but it would be great to see more of a longer-term, you know, stepwise progression into, you know, more of the menu. Yeah, thank you. And, and along with that, you know, greater measurability of actual consumption, and even, oh, I have the mic. Um, you know, do even with the healthy weight commitment, do we have um, evidence that people are consuming less calories? They're buying less calories, and that's a great first step too. Yeah, I think consumption <laughs> actually was tracked uh, with Nielsen panel data on that particular one. Yeah, especially households with kids. I think we saw a 66 calorie per person drop in those calories. But to your point, make it measurable. It's got to be measurable. Yeah, my take on this, and again, I'm not trying to pick on the restaurant uh, group. But my take is that this is, all right, you at least have put something on the board. So I give them credit. Awareness, as marketers know, is step one. So we get past awareness. It's like, all right, how do we make things effective? And I think if there were either percent of their portfolios that were better for you or a reduction in something they tracked, whether it's calories or 
or other ingredients or percent of products for kids that were healthier and you track it over time, I think it could have a little bit more teeth to it. I also think just listing it, uh, you know, when I say, uh, well, you just have to make um, nutrition information available if somebody pushes it. I don't think that goes far enough. So again, good start, but a lot of work to be done. Lawrence, you had a question. I have a microphone for him. Lawrence Williams with the United States Healthful Food Council. I think one of the problems, I mean, you're, you have a background, I know at least in part, with behavioral economics and understand the business incentives. And there's a lot of research that suggests if you want to drive down sales of an item, label it healthy. And so part of the concern is, I mean, there's a lot of research on this. I'm, you know, it's, it, I mean, everybody in the room laughs, and I, I get it. But it is, it's been documented in the restaurant settings. Uh, the the, the um, uh, Cornell Food and Brand Lab has done a lot of research mm -hmm. on this exact topic. So, you know, some of the problems with this, and the same thing, I think, with taking calories out and, you know, labeling things um, lower calories, sometimes there are actually uh, perverse unintended consequences to some of these efforts. And that's, I guess, just to put in a plug, a more holistic solution is, uh, I believe, necessary. I think my person next to me also had a question. So, um, thanks. I was just curious when we looked at sort of, again, measurables from the promotion side. I sort of build on this, but, you know, I think you can do a lot without necessarily labeling it healthy. In other words, this particular item, if you just look at it, is not probably as appealing as some of the other things to kids. So there's a way of making something appealing. Also, in terms of promotion, this is really an association effort, not a restaurant effort. So when you even look at the promotion on this, most of the promotion is being handled by the um, restaurant association. So I commend them tremendously about making this available. But again, restaurants, if they wanted this, might price this different, might place it on the menu different, um, and then label it with a more exciting term than necessarily healthy. So there's a lot of way of, of attracting people to this that doesn't necessarily pull out the health. Yeah, I think those are very valid points. And again, um, to your point and to what Lawrence just mentioned, I mean, we use the term stealth health. I mean, a product that's more indulgent or um, it's a kiss of death, if you call it healthy. If you say yogurt's more healthy, you can get away with it because they perceive yogurt to be a healthier product. So not a problem there. But once you start going to the more indulgent products, it doesn't work. Becky, did you have a question? So this is from the live stream. It's from L Silver at PHI. Um, to have a population health impact, unless you change the default and most highly promoted products, you are unlikely to have a significant impact. A single healthy choice alone is not enough. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I think what, uh, for instance, McDonald's has learned with its Happy Meals now, when you start making apple slices default as opposed to the other options, you just automatically get more uptake of those products. Uh, we find it uh, with purchasing things like health insurance, okay, if things are just signing up for 401k plans. If you're inside an organization, the more they're just automatic the easier it is. So I think in principle that that's a great question and I would agree. So I think what we're concluding, just because I do need to move along, is that, hey, good start. All right, we got something on the boards. Now we just need to add more teeth to it, make it more quantifiable and have some very tangible goals and perhaps over a five-year period to increase the percent of menu items that are healthier for kids under a certain standard that might be developed. I mean, we've worked with University of Minnesota Nutrition Coordinating Center, someone like that, and say, okay, that's our goal, and that's what we commit to. So again, just wanted to use that for illustrative purposes compared to Partnership for a Healthy America and a Healthy Weight. So let me touch on some barriers before we get to our guests. Um, I love this. The genesis of our problems is really Genesis, Genesis 11 to be. And they said, let us build ourselves a tower. But the Lord said, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. And still we are speaking different languages. And that's, that's what I want to get into uh, this afternoon a little bit more. Uh, graduating from the good guy, bad guy kind of dialogue to the 
you know, we just speak different languages. So how do we understand each other's languages a little bit better as we move forward? And, and one of the areas are the way uh, the detailed reports are done. So this is just taken from uh, University of North Carolina, Barry Popkin and his team on a healthy weight commitment. And, and again, standard format is an abstract up front, and then there's a lot of background, a lot of emphasis on the methodology, which has to be demonstrated it's rigorous and robust, and then a detailed discussion, and then a little bit at the end on perhaps some conclusions or implications. Um, and of course, the, uh, the mandatory and more research is needed, so we understand that. So that is, that is basically what is accepted by the um, academic community because it needs to be gold standard. It needs to be bulletproof in terms of the way it was done. Now, just using another example, we pluck from a, a hypothetical choice chocolate analogy. You can see that it's real quick. I mean, this, this is it, by the way. This isn't the introduction or the abstract. This is it. And uh, all right, they did a little research. They found out their sales were going down on their primary chocolate product. And the solution is we have a new product called Slim Choice that'll go out there that's a little better, you know, has better nutrients, you know, less calories. And the recommendations get it out into market, do ABC. It's more focused on, yeah, no, we have a problem, looked into it. Here's our solution and here's what we're going to do about it. So it's more action oriented as opposed to a debate about whether it's a problem or not. And you know what we've tried to do with, uh, you've seen this uh, outside our reports, we have to remember who our audience is. So again, with an academic report, the audience, uh, is academic, public health community, medical community, advocate community, et cetera, okay? Um, for something like we do, our audiences are business executives because we want them to change. And I can speak from personal experience, you know, so if I get the detailed 17-page report, I don't read it. I don't read it. I can't read it. I don't have the time to read it. It's not that I don't want to read it. I've got a stack of things in my inbox, but I don't have the time. So what tends to happen is we have to understand the languages and the way each communicate. So the quicker you can do and get to the bullet points, so what you know, we try to do is, you know, here's your four bullet points, guys. All right, here's what it means. Get with the program. Uh, and here's what it means for you. We always have uh, implications. So again, step back and say, if you want to have impact on the business side, perhaps find a way to achieve the academic needs to demonstrate rigor. Um, and at the same time, maybe it's a secondary recap. Maybe it's a one-page recap that goes out along with it for the industry people to read. I mean, there will be people inside companies, particularly in the, the science groups or the R&D groups, that will read it. They're interested in that. But the decision makers, the people who impact how they spend their money and what they do with their products, it's too much. It's too much for them. So I just wanted to highlight that because that, that's a huge difference. The other thing is the headsets are different. The headsets are very different. The industry, there's one word you need to learn about companies, and it's growth. They must grow. If they don't grow, they die. All right, whether it's good or bad is moot. They have to grow. And when I say grow, they have to grow their revenues, their market share, their profits, their consumer base, because if they don't, Let's put it down to economics. Their stock price just stagnates. The stock pi a stagnating stock price means the CEO goes bye-bye. All right, it doesn't happen. So that's what drives them. And by the way, on an individual level, you know, they may care quite a bit. Most of these people are parents, so they care about what their kids eat and drink. But when they go into that office, because of the Wall Street pressure, on especially with the public companies, uh, they need to grow their companies. Uh, whereas, again, from the public health perspective, custodians of the public health. So looking for more health outcomes are your metrics. Okay, you want to see that obesity rates come down. And what tends to happen oftentimes is, all right, from an industry standpoint, I'm trying to grow my business. Yeah, I know people need to eat better, but you know what? I'm not going to hit my quarterly numbers if 
I don't continue to add line extensions to my you know, potato chip line or something like that. I mean, and then we'll show you later why they go for lower hanging fruit, and I say that fruit with quotes around it because it's not less necessarily literal. All right, there are distinctions. And this chart here may be the most important one we talk about today. Okay? Let's, I love segmentation because it really helps us understand. Let's talk about the axes here, where people who are more concrete versus conceptual and more operators versus, let's say, evaluators or um, people who are more cause-oriented, you know, because I think the academic and public health community tends to be both. You know, you're interested in evaluating, but also you do care. That's why you're in this space, because you care about people's health. So let's start on the left there with our operator friends, whom I'm calling opera. Retailers, restaurateurs are operators. Now, operators, for, for operators, long-term planning is lunch. Okay? Long-term planning is lunch. All right? Very task orientation. Because if they're not paying attention to stocking the shelves or cleaning the tables or making sure the frying oil vat is at 325.7 degrees Fahrenheit, they have a problem. All right? And they will go out of business if they don't execute. So it's about execution. So the people in this space tend to be very good at doing. They're very good at it. Okay, now again, a lot, you get some creative types coming in to start the concept. So the one who might start Chipotle or Whole Foods, they're going to have more of a vision. But the day-to-day -day operations of these places, uh, they're really focused on the near term. Okay? Then you have this next group I call the strategists. All right? These are the packaged goods people in general. They tend to be heavily MBA types. All right, who are making the business decisions in these. Now, these are people who could be consultants from McKinsey, quite frankly. Uh, they could be doctors if they chose to. Sometimes the extroverted gene shows up, so you can't help it. You've got to be marketing people. Uh, they're bigger picture, and they can plan out five or ten years. They can see a horizon, so they're kind of your best approach at starting to make progress because they could look at all sides of an issue. They might not agree with certain points of view, but they are capable certainly of looking at all sides of an issue. And then of course, when we look at the academic and public health community, again, you say, again, we talked about there's lots of ideas, very conceptual. Okay, you can think, you can talk about things that might happen, missions, opportunities, and Sometimes there's an awful lot of stuff going on at the same time, too. And so the beauty of it is you're going to think of everything. The bad news is you're going to think of everything. All right? So we have to find the way to run, start running things down the funnel. So one way to look at it uh, is, you know, the ideas eventually need some kind of funnel in the middle here to get down to the execution or the implementation. So what tends to happen, going back to our Tower of Babel analogy, the Venn diagram of the retailers and the Venn diagram of the academics and the public health, those puppies aren't overlapping much. They're, they're having a tough time finding some common ground. Common ground's more likely to come out of the middle here. And when you start putting some other descriptors, our operators are the traditionalists. Okay? Change is a four-letter word. Okay? Change, we don't, even if it's good for me, we don't like change. Okay? Spreadsheet's done for 18 months, I don't want to mess with it. Okay? I have my way of doing it. It's, we keep the baby and the dirty bath water. We just don't like change. Okay? Very important to understand about the retail side. Our friends in the packaged goods arena are a lot more pragmatist. Okay? They, again, ultimately, they know they have pressured to hit their numbers. It's very interesting when you sit down with an executive one-on-one, -on -one, just for an hour, and you talk to them about what they like, and they'll spin off all these new product ideas and ideas for companies and ways to do this. But when it comes down to action, uh, I've got to hit my numbs. So it's very interesting. They're kind of torn, a little bit of uh, good angel, bad angel on the shoulders. And then, of course, when you look at the public health 
community and academics, you know, you're talking about more mission. Again, when you talk about public health, you're on a mission to improve people's lives. That's a cause. That's a cause. And again, change is a good word here because that's the motivator that you could make things better. So I think the reason I feel this is so important is that at least it helps you understand where potential barriers show, where you might have similarity and where you might have barriers with the various groups. And then on top of that, you do have skepticism. Uh, I was at a corporate meeting uh, giving a talk two weeks ago and the notion of transparency and truthfulness came up. Big, big, big topic. And uh, this still lives. I think this is the period now where we get a chance to break down um, a lot of mistrust because as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, distrust is very expensive and my interpretation of that is think about it. The longer it takes us mutually to get to solutions on issues like childhood obesity or improving the food quality, we lose another generation of kids. We lose another generation of kids. So worrying about being right or not to me, I'm a pragmatist, I must admit, I'm one of those former CPG guys. My concern is that we have to figure out constructively what works and then shed off some of the absolute positions but on both sides of the debate. I think it makes a huge difference if we can think about this. So really the solution is finding, we talk about the Venn diagrams, snippets of DNA that work for both of us because we're never going to totally agree. In fact, for the majority of issues, industry and public health will likely not agree. We have to carve off those snippets of DNA. So at this point, what we're going to do um, is invite our guests today. I have two outstanding guests joining us, uh, people who are public health champions now in industry. And joining us from Nestle is Wendy Johnson Askew, Vice President of Corporate Affairs for Nestle Nutrition. Uh, Wendy joined them as a policy head and actually has spent prior to that, 10 years with the National Institute of Health. So she has a tremendous background in, as a health policy advisor. Uh, she's also a graduate of UNC, for those of you on, online from UNC, Tar Hill. I happen to live in Chapel Hill too, so we have a couple of Tar Hills here. And then uh, joining us from Bangkok, Thailand is Richard Black. And uh, we'll see if we have Richard with us momentarily. I'll give you a little background on Richard. Richard is the Vice President of Global Nutrition at PepsiCo. There is Richard. Good morning, Richard. It's three something in the morning in Bangkok, Thailand. Thank you, Richard. No, no, no. It's 2.30. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, it's, this is a piece of cake then. Uh, Richard's background is Richard uh, formerly was the uh, Chief Nutrition Officer with Kraft. He had been with Kellogg's and Nestle before and actually was um, an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and got his PhD in psychiatry on eating behavior. So could you kindly join me in welcoming Wendy and Richard to our session today? What I thought we would do is throw out some issues and topics that uh, Wendy and Richard could talk about today from their very unique perspectives. Again, seeing both sides uh, of the corporate public health divide. And perhaps, uh, let me start with you, Wendy, in terms of you were with the National Institute of Health, and then you go to Nestle Infant Nutrition, and so what, what prompted you to do that? What did you think you could get accomplished? Why did you do it? Well, I guess over the years, I had been pushing individuals for behavior change, trying to teach them, trying to um, make it important to them to make them to prioritize it, um, and, and with great success, except when they got into the food environment. So the food environment was not supportive of the changes that I was asking people to make. 
and especially for some of the communities that I was working with, which were largely disenfranchised communities, who had a lot of things, a lot of complications, complicated lives. And so to think that that would be top of mind for them is a little bit of a stretch when you have so many other competing priorities. So I saw my opportunity to go to a company like Nestle to make differences in food products and to change that food environment so that it was more supportive. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Richard, your perspectives on this? Sure. I think just by way of background, so folks uh, know, I come from Canada, many of you know that already. Um, I was, as Hank said, assistant professor in nutritional sciences at the University of Toronto. My first uh, industry role was with Kellogg's. And I'm guessing I was less than a year into the job, um, and I was invited to sit on a, a government panel, you know, health protection branch, in, uh, government of Canada. There is um, this opportunity when you're in industry to have an impact, whether it's with policy, whether it's with what the company makes, very very early on in my career, that would never have happened uh, for me. I think through an academic stream. So that was the first week. Wow, that's really a huge opportunity. But the, the, uh, for me, the bigger piece, and I've used this number before, um, so many of you have heard this, but the PepsiCo, I know the number is even larger for, for Nestle, it's a big company. But for PepsiCo, over one billion times a day, somebody consumes a serving of one of our products every day of the year. And so if I can work within PepsiCo to shift, um, the nutrition profile, broadly speaking, that's the portfolio of our foods. You know, we can reach, the I can reach out and touch over a billion people every time, every day, 365 days a year. Very hard to do that. Um, I don't think there are enough advocates in the food industry who understand the importance of what we do. And um, that's why I work with the food industry. We have an impact on people's health. All right. Thank you, Richard. I think for the most you know, I think those are, those are two important perspectives because um, not too many people can answer that particular question for us. Richard, let me go back to you. And as you've watched the conversation evolve over the past three, four, five years, what have you seen are uh, perhaps some progress that's been made in the industry public health dialogue and also perhaps some of the challenges that still perpetuate? Uh, so let me go back to, uh, you were talking about the Health and Equipment Foundation and uh, the targets there and the measurable. I see the camera here in the back. Basically, there at least there, like I said. A lot of conversation when we first began that partnership um, to come to an agreement on what was going to And uh, it was very broad, and it down, and down, and down again. And so we eventually ended up with the uh, It could have been a whole bunch of things. And whether or not you agree with this approach that get 100 calories out of 30 days and have a it was a very clear target that we had. Suddenly, we measured that actually go after that. And I think having such a clear target in a public private partnership, despite other disagreements that we might have had in terms of what is the best approach, particularly I can take on, on uh, the obesity, in this case, in fact, child obesity, that ability to agree on a very specific target and hold ourselves accountable for that, I think, is critical. Um, that's the kind of success I think we have going forward. The, the gentleman in the back mentioned something about living the public and it's no longer going to sell. Absolutely true sure about this one. And so, and you mentioned self vision I think if we can find better ways to uh, improve the nutrition profile of our products without having to be on the screen. And there's always been a pushback too in terms of people to build within a company you, you get market and uh, people saying, why would I ever change the appearance of my food if you want to get healthier? When you tell me it's not going to do any good to talk about it, why would I make that change? And the reality is, um, we have to make these kind of changes. 
for a variety of reasons, like these uh, regulatory has been in place, but also for the things that drive them towards healthy food across, across the spectrum. In my view, it's sort of the green companies take out the game, in other words, the, it's, that's the anti to the market space to improve the quality of the nutrition profile of foods. So there, there are some things like that we want to hear about. What, what I always worry about is uh, on both sides, and again, even the just on both sides of the competition, industry side, activist side, if you want, and the else, um, a willingness to portray the other side with, I'll say, facts or opinions, or uh, let our options sort of take out of contact. And so they don't accurately, in my view, reflect what's actually going on in the real world. Uh, it goes on, it's on both sides. And I think it's, uh, my, I don't know what I can do. Sorry, I won't do that one. But that's the thing I think that we have to do is trying to paint the other adversarial position, whatever that might be, uh, in a negative light, definitely support things. And I said, I, I, I think I've seen that happen on all sides of the end. It's happening in politics all the time. We all know that. Uh, and that's been the most frustrating thing. I understand it raises the other people. It's a issue. But it's incredibly frustrating. All right, thank you, Richard. Wendy, your thoughts on that? So, you know, I think what's most challenging, as you mentioned, um, I, I went to uh, industry after... 20 some odd years of, of being in the public sector and I love public health let me say that up front I'm a public health trained nutritionist and I'm a trained researcher and that is where my heart lies I think I was taken aback by the amount of um, nastiness that some of my colleagues approached me with because I had gone to the dark side. <laughs> so, and, and so this started this whole debate in my mind of if we really are interested in changing people's health, shouldn't everyone who's interested in changing people's health have a seat at the table? So I, I think what is challenging, um, as Richard mentioned, is that there are bad actors on both sides. Um, I think that we do speak a very different language, a very, very different language. And we have to find a way to communicate because the people who are getting caught, caught in the crossfires of our debate are those who are most vulnerable. And I don't think that's quite fair. I don't think that's what we want as public health researchers and as people who are advocates for public health. The challenge, however, remains that we have to figure out a way to talk to each other in a way that is respectful, a way that we can focus on the issues, um, and a way that we're looking forward to outcomes. Richard, um, on the focus on issues, uh, does that make a lot of sense to you from your purview too, if we just focus on the issues? and we use those as the building blocks for cooperation that we could make more headway? I, I do think we could. I, I think it's important though, uh, while focusing on the issues, you have to acknowledge the places where you might not see eye to eye. Um, and it doesn't mean that because we don't agree on this, we can't work together. I think, I don't pay, I say a lot of attention to the NFL, but you can get people from two different cities in this country. I don't know, maybe Seattle and Boston, and have very different views on which better football team, and very passionate views about which better football team. That doesn't mean they can't work together on other things. And I know that football is divorced, but my point is that there are places we can acknowledge we disagree, part those to the side for the time being, in order to allow us the opportunity to make progress going forward in other areas where we do agree and where we can come to some notion of what we do the forward. 
Where do you think the biggest problems lie? I mean, one of the topics that comes up that I end up being confronted with when I give talks, for instance, is the whole science and study arena in terms of what is truth versus what's not truth and allowing perhaps um, some things to perpetuate. I mean, one of the hot button issues which we'll be getting to later on when we start talking about things like artificial sweeteners, um, sugar sweetened beverages, et cetera, and people have different opinions and then science gets used in different ways and perhaps almost sometimes sins of omission about commenting or not. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, is there a better way to, to marry the science of what's really going on from both food industry and public health community in a way that you can end up with some constructive action as opposed to ending up in a divisive arena. Wendy, perhaps, maybe you can tackle that uh, first. I think that was one of the, the big draws to me of Nestle, of course, is their, their great breadth of science in the nutrition arena. Um, in particular, I work with uh, Gerber, and so we've done a whole lot with the Feeding Infant and Toddler Study. And we've been able to collaborate with a lot of different government agencies, NGOs, to, to um, talk about this science. It is still interesting, however, that the, the scientists who were trained, um, as a matter of fact, my colleague is also a UNC graduate, Guitar Hills, um, and she has done this work since 2002. And it's all still being met with um, some degree of skepticism because it came out of industry. So even though the methods are out there for everyone to review, even though the results are pretty robust and have been proven over time, uh, we were the, the first one to, to show that um, the number one vegetable for young children was french fries. Um, and I don't want to get into a potato debate. I understand you had that a couple of weeks ago in DC, so I'm not going to go there. But it has also been shown that, that, that children's diets uh, settle in really early by the age of two. And this was shown again by the CDC that it held until the children are six. We know that it looks like adults' diets and so therefore we think it holds for a very long time beyond the age of six. But by the same methodology that is accepted, this research has been taken as suspect because it came out of industry. I don't think that really helps us move the, the button along. So, um, you know, and it, it's something for us to think about, you know, how, how can we marry the two sciences so that we aren't continuing to repeat and redo in this time of limited funding um, the same research? How can we move the research f ahead by using some of what comes out of industry as well as some of what comes out of government and foundations? Richard, your thoughts on that? It's the, it's one of my particular sore points, in fact, is this notion that industry-funded research is, by default, suspect. I understand why people would say that. Um, the Obesity Society last year came out with a statement that uh, forcefully says the funding source should not, I don't think it's a camera, should not be used in determining the validity, or should not be considered, I should say, determining the validity of the science. The science must be judged on its on its own uh, accord. Now, people will continue to look back at that, but I think that's a step forward. Um, part of the challenge is that when you look at food industry studies, in small or large, a lot of them might come out in a way that seems positive for the food industry. And I'll say, yeah, because food industry is inherently conservative, in, in the research investment we make. Uh, we have a very, very small research bunch of folks in pharmaceuticals. And so you tend not to fund studies or go after opportunities unless we have, because of everything else that you've seen, or things like that, you have a pretty good notion that it's going to work out the way you think, the way you hope it might. It doesn't always, but you hope it would. Um, when it doesn't work out, though, I think the trick here is to insist that those data get published as well. And I think um, it's a, just a, a consequence of the, the peer review process that negative studies are not nearly so appealing as positive ones. Um, 
sometimes they can be very good. I looked at the, the uh, Judd paper that was funded by ILSI and published just after, just before I started working at ILSI 2001. Um, funded by the food industry through ILSI, USDA lab, looking at trans fat intake and um, cholesterol levels, cardiovascular disease risk. It was clear when that study was done, trans fat, bad idea. Absolutely bad idea. Funded by the food industry. Did not have the way the food industry would like at that time. But that then, Essentially, it drove change in the food industry. You might say it was the labeling piece, but there was nothing to fall back on at that point. So, the food industry can, in fact, uh, publish things like that, that that don't necessarily come up the way they would like to see it. I think we get beyond this, oh, they only, everything's always positive when they do the research, if everything is published. But another uh, look on that is actually the measure that we go after sometimes and for reductions. Sodium, sat fat, added sugar, that sort of thing. I'm a big fan of talking about tons of whatever removed from the diet. I was at a meeting um, up in Canada last year and just had a conversation, QA period. Barry was on the panel, actually, very often. Coming from Mary Labbe, she said, Richard, that's just marketing when you talk about tons. Tell me about the percent reductions. Tell me about the percent reductions. That's what makes a difference. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's probably uh, 20 to 30 percent of our portfolio, and this is too many company, that represents about 5 percent of our total business. So I could do 50 percent sodium reduction across those SKUs. Huge! 30 percent of my SKUs, stop keeping in right? 30 percent of products, 30 percent of them, I reduced by 50 percent. And everybody in that room, I think, would say, wow, that's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, well, that was only 5% of my portfolio. And if I look at another product, Lay's potato chips, huge business. I take a little bit out of Lay's across this enormous business. And I say, yeah, there was a 10% reduction in Lay's. Well, that's not much. But if you look at the actual sodium that's taking out of the food supply as a result of that, because that business is so big, those numbers are enormous. And so the public health impact of that is far, far larger than doing really big reductions on really tiny volume products. And it really gets down to, you know, you can do the math, you can say 3,400 milligrams a day average, 360 million, million people in the country, 30, I can't remember the population is. Do the math, that's how many tons of something that's in the day. And we want to get that tonnage down. And that's what we should be targeting. Um, but the, there's, a, there's a pushback on, well, what's the right measure in all these things? And so if we come out with measures, we're sometimes accused of saying, well, we just have to mark the perspective. Now, then the last comment then goes back up with the foundation. I'll say again, just an outstanding, not just as Lisa's there, an outstanding example of um, a collaborative within uh, the food industry and then, of course, with Johnson Foundation. Spoke with Barry, I suppose, Barry, and many people in the territory that he wrote for the company publication of Barry's articles. And he was convinced that uh, the food industry uh, knew well in advance that they were going to achieve those target numbers. And, uh, you know, if we did, we had no clue that we were going to do that. Um, but there was this notion that we had to agree to it, that we must have known. Um, we couldn't because every company contributed what they thought their targets might be or what they might achieve separately. And of course, we exceeded it by 4x. And it's that um, first notion is on the distance. And scientific field, fair enough, convince me otherwise. But it doesn't matter how many times you try to convince me, again, that's a, a frustration. And I think that that external validation that Barry provided went a long way to the country's concerns. But there's a lot more to do in this space. I think that it's just a, it's a really tough one. Yeah. Well, Richard brought up the notion of skepticism in essence. We're, we're back over that. You know, is there something we can do? let's say, from an industry side or a public health side to try to break down more of that trustworthy, skeptical type barrier that seems to persist. I mean, I've seen improvements myself, but nevertheless, it still persists. 
You know, I think what is what's interesting to me is, as I mentioned, I went to Nestle at, in 2011, so it's 2015, not quite four years, and I'm seeing big changes. I'm seeing um, a lot more discussion about public and private partnerships. You know, at first it was very timid, and now we're getting bolder where we're beginning to think about ways that we can actually um, test. It, it, it's like when we went from interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary, coming up with what the different tenets of that look like. And I think that's where we are now. So I, I think that the opportunity for industry is to engage in some experimentation with, um, with the public health sector on actually taking a, an objective look at what we're doing to see if we're really moving the needle, because that's what's most important. But we have to do it in a common language. And I think if we can do it in a research language of sorts, where we both can hear ourselves and we can both resonate with both groups, I think there's an opportunity. I think we have to move. Uh, we can't afford to continue to talk about what the barriers are and, and those kinds of things, because I think we've done that almost ad nauseum. It's time for us to start moving this, this along. Um, I got very excited this year, active member of the American Public Health Association, and have been for over 30 years. And on the stage, I heard Dr. Benjamin speak to the need for public-private partnerships and doing things differently. That was quite a moment for me. I was very excited about that. So we're starting to see Dr. Benjamin, we're, doc, um, we're starting to see RWJF talk, start to talk about this. So I'm encouraged that we're at a point where we can really start to look at this very critically, um, put some money behind it so we can study the process of building these partnerships to outcome. Not just building the partnerships, but building the partnerships to outcome. And I think this will help us um, adapt. And to Richard's point, no, we're never going to agree on everything. And that's okay. Different government agencies don't agree on everything. I can tell you, I've stayed there. Uh, <laughs> but I think what we, the, if we can agree on the things that we agree upon and agree to move those things forward, I think that would be a, a good step forward. Yeah. Richard, would you like to add to that? No, I think, I think Wendy said it well. Thanks. All right, because one of the things that uh, have come up, for instance, would there be resistance, you know, given that there's skepticism to, let's say, the research conducted by industry versus research, let's say, that's sanctioned uh, from the academic or even uh, a Robert Wood Johnson perspective? Can more and more of those kinds of studies be done together? I think so. I think the, um, the issue is, you know, from being in a bunch of meetings about public-private partnerships, people get really nervous about money changing hands. That gets really, people really get their back up about that. And I can understand that because then you sort of lose who you are in the process. Um, I think if we have some type of third party who would be the fiduciary agent for that. Um, and, and what we would do is come to the table with our ideas and ideas about study methodology and agree on outcomes and we analyze it. I liken it to community-based participatory research, which I spent a lot of time studying. I mean, everybody has to be, and the word partner drives people nuts, but everybody has to be included in the design of it, the interpretation of it, and the outcome of it. And we have to decide how we're going to talk about these things on both sides. Because if you think about industry, I mean, industry is trying hard to let people know we're out here. We don't want to kill our consumers. We want our consumers to live a long time so that they can continue to consume. It's ludicrous to think that we're out here doing things to kill people. That is, that's just crazy. But at the same time, the public health community um, wants to make sure that we're doing sound science and things that we can, we can translate across and, and, and disseminate into communities and groups that will, will make health better. So determining how to talk about this in a way that lets everyone feel that it's a win for them is something that has to go forward first. And then we can, we can start to move it along. 
Well, I want to leave a couple of minutes for any questions, but I'll let... Yes. Can I interrupt for a second? I just want to add something to what Wendy said on that. Sure. Uh, just to stress the point that the words that we use to label an initiative are so important. And that's what you were just saying. Um, and the example I'll give you is I've been working with the Obesity Society for the last hour, three years, slowly trying to uh, keep something forward, and it was uh, move something forward uh, to have a better engagement with the community. And uh, Harvey Grill was, uh, I guess he was the president elect at the time, he started talking. When I know Harvey from previous life, then it was the president, then past president. And the question was, okay, we're going to do the, what are we going to call this group of food industry? Well, they had a, a pharmaceutical council of some sort. And, um, you know, the Food Industry Advisory Council. Well, bad answer. Because there's no way the food industry should be advising the obesity society. And what we ended up settling on was Food Industry Engagement Council. And it's just a subtle difference but it stresses the kind of connection that we're hoping to have. That it's an engagement, it's for both ways. It's not one providing advice to the other. I mean, we have an external advisory council, a company, a company, we bring in eminent scientists, they advise us. They tell us what they think, and then we can figure out what to do with it. We don't try to tell them what to do. But this is an engagement council. And I think several things like that, if you think about what you're doing as you go into these things, it's just words, but it makes a big, big difference in the way that these uh, partnerships are yeah, good idea. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, if any of you would like to address any questions to Wendy and Richard, uh, have a microphone, or we have a question from the live stream audience. Yes. This is again from Elle Silver at PHI. I say, hello, Richard. You've been a real partner on the National Salt Reduction Initiative discussion, but progress has still not been all we hoped. How do you envision real progress on salt reduction occurring in the U.S.? Uh, so, hi, back. <laughs> First of all, I hope things are going well there at PHI. Um, it's interesting. Uh, so, I was at Mont Crap Mont when. New York started down that path, and that's where that comment comes from. Salt is a really, really tough one to reduce. Um, our company, uh, at Texaco now, had this I think, rather audacious goal of uh, salt reduction, and we made phenomenal progress against it. Didn't reach, won't reach the tar target. Initially, was 2015, 25% reduction around the world. Um, so we backed that off to 2020. Because I think uh, at the end of last year we were about 10% across top 10 markets, roughly 80% of the world. But that's a huge, huge push forward. The problem is the technology for everything. And a lot of smaller companies, bigger companies, like uh, Kraft, Bondelese, uh, Pepsico, have the resources to dedicate to figuring this problem out. And it's not just with the salt, it's a whole bunch of other things we'll go into. Smaller companies don't. One of the things we've done in Mexico is work now with IFT in an upcoming conference schedule for smaller companies on sodium reduction technologies and bring together suppliers who uh, might have sodium alternatives with smaller companies that can deliver that technology. It's, it's just really, really hard. Um, you can make changes up to a point, but then you start really negatively or negatively impact cost. With the technologies we have today, I am very hopeful and I think we're going to get tremendous progress going forward. And we're probably going to get progress not on topical um, sodium on the product, but the sodium in the product makes up um, the functions, the, the food functionality. The example I used to use when we talked about York, if you have a hot dog, which has a casing and the meat in the inside. The sodium level goes down too low. The, the meat inside the hot dog casing doesn't stack. And it's just um, liquid. So there's a limit below which you cannot go in a hot dog with the current technology that we have. Uh, if you want to get something that doesn't just break apart when you bite into it. If we can solve those kinds of problems, that's when we're going to have huge advances in sodium reduction. People don't realize that 
you use sodium alkali to stop the fermentation process of cocoa pods, which is with the cocoa beans, which they the chocolate. There's just the fermentation, just the processing way before food companies exist. That processing approach puts sodium into the system. You don't even have any control over it as a food company. So how do we get them back up to check? It, things like that are the things we have to start to do. It's not just the topical piece that most people think it over. So it's still a long road to go on for this. All right. Any more questions? All right, we're right about on time, which is good. I, I just have to thank Wendy and Richard so much. Please thank me. Thank them <laughs> for their time. <laughs> Richard, go get some sleep. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Wendy, terrific. Thanks for being here. Okay, we have um, a final section here. And I'm amazed we're on time. I want to get into some of the strategies for making this all come together now. And we'll look at things like best practices and what can we learn from companies that are doing things in this arena. But perhaps more important is what tools can be made available for the public health community so that you can engage industry more effectively and be more effective yourselves and get into more actionable plans. And I want to talk a little bit about metrics because metrics is the different language depending on the groups. And then finally, how do we build on our uh, successes? So I want to use a couple of case studies. Uh, General Mills is one I like to use uh, General Mills has what they call this product improvement model, all right, where they have this James Ford Bell Research Center where they do quite a bit of research on dietary side, product development. They understand the relationship between diet and products, and they do quite a bit of nutrition education. And then going back to an earlier comment, uh, they spend a lot of time in what they call stealth health, and that is don't tell anybody it's healthy in many of their product categories because they run the risk of curtailing the sales of these products. And, that, and the other thing they do is inch down. Uh, when I was in industry, what we used to do is to cut costs down. Companies are constantly looking at ways to shave ingredient costs out of their products, all right, regardless of health or not. So if there's a new ingredient, I mean, that's why they went bluntly to high fructose corn syrup instead of sugar years ago because the sugar price was up there. And guess what? This stuff's cheaper, and we sell billions of cases of these products. So that's a lot of money. So they've always been doing that. The key now is they've also learned that even for cost-cutting purposes, if they change the flavor of a product too much from the expectation of a regular user, that was the death knell for the product. It's too much. It's too much a field for what the consumer was expecting. So they've learned to inch it down. And then, of course, the final criteria they apply is, is this sustainable in the market? I mean, is it good enough to keep turning over sales? Now, what they've done is they made a commitment in 2004 on the left to increase the nutritional content of up to 80% of their products by fiscal year 2016. And that's May 31st, 2016. And the way they were going to do this was off on the right hand side, basically get rid of in red the limiters, you know, saturated fats, trans fats, and increase the positives. Uh, again, whole grains is a big example for what they did. But look at what they've done here. They quantified it. They put a report card out there, and this is reported in their system corporate social responsibility report, also their annual report. And so now all of a sudden you've got Fiber One as a $400 million business because they've been pushing in this area. They have plunked quite a bit of sugar out of their cereals. Uh, although I, I did get a report from them that on the Lucky Charms, uh, once they tried to get it down to around nine or so, they stopped because 
the marshmallows sank to the bottom. And that's, that's a no-no. <laughs> Lucky Charms marshmallows don't sit on the bottom. So that's it. We're done with this project. Happy to help. But the marshmallows have to float. And when you compare them to their uh, food peers, uh, their, af their profit margins were superior. So again, you have this nice confluence, as a lot of our research has shown, that companies that are paying attention to this better for you space, if you would, actually are performing better. So it's not an either or type of circumstance here. It's, it's going back to win-win. PepsiCo is an interesting one. Uh, and I want to use this almost as a case study also, like we did earlier. They have their definition of nutrition, or nutrition brands, nutrition-oriented products, is the consumer shifting in this direction. And now that they recognize this, over 20% of their sales are coming from what they call nutrition-type products. And compared to 2006, uh, and these are Richard's numbers, uh, they pulled out quite a bit of sodium, saturated fats, and in particular, quite a bit of sugar. I mean, a ton of sugar. That's North America alone, not even globally. And what they're doing is they're looking now, it's basically the old Quaker Oats company, which had Quaker Oats, Tropicana added to it, Gatorade, Propel, Naked Juice. They're really looking to that division as their growth division, okay, as opposed to the more traditional products. And what they're projecting is that when you look at the calories per person that they're selling, you know, 1997, so you're talking about 17 years ago, it was 77 calories per person. Now moving down to today, 65 calories per person. They're projecting in a few years for it to be 50 calories per person coming out of each one of their beverages. So you can see, again, they're keeping track of it. They're saying, hey, we're not perfect, but we're going in the right direction. So again, I, I applaud them for that. Now, key challenges. If you're, put your head on, put your hat on for a minute, your PepsiCo cap on. And you say, okay, wait a minute. We have the, we're seeing declining sales of not only our sugar-sweetened beverages and sodas, but also our diet drinks. They're, they're both going down. Over 70% of our sales and profits come from brands perceived as less healthy. And Wall Street's beating up on us to sell more of these high-profit items like the sodas and the Frito-Lay business. So what do you do? All right, so imagine for a moment you're now, let's say, with Richard inside PepsiCo. What, what would you do? Any, any thoughts on how you might approach this? It's not an easy question. And there's no easy answer to this. I'm just using this to highlight that it's important for us to understand the constraints that these corporations work under. So, for instance, in the case of Nestle, of which Wendy represents. So in their meals division, which is Stouffer's and Lean Cuisine and what have you, they're, they're in a similar bind. They're, they're selling Stouffer. They're selling mac and cheese and all that yummy stuff. And they have a brand called Lean Cuisine, which should be just chugging along during it. And guess what? It's soft. Soft, by the way, is a nice euphemism for going down. All right, so that's just terminology. But so what do you do? How do you balance it? And, and I like to talk about things in terms of transition, okay? If in the case of Pepsi, where you have 70, 80% of your portfolio and less healthy products, can they go to 100% healthy tomorrow morning or even in 10 years or 15 years? Highly unlikely. They wouldn't be allowed to. Every CEO, respectively, would get fired three months into that program if they said, well, because here's how they would do it. Their highest profits come from sodas. The profit margins are over 90%. Frito-Lay business profit margins are over 70%. Okay? So their challenge is trying to figure out ways to morph those businesses into better-for-you versions, which is tough to do, or build the percent of your sales coming from healthier items from the old Quaker Oats company, which is a little easier to do, and all of a sudden they become a bigger percent of your company's sales. That's an avenue that they can live with. They can still make a lot of progress. And again, as, as both Wendy and, and Richard stated, you don't have to do much to some of these huge brands to make a, an incredible dent in the market. 
so again, this is not easy. I just use this to, to highlight the point because there's lots of companies like this that are making progress, but they're really, it's yin and yang. They're really struggling. They have multiple bosses, if you would. So given that quickie background, what are some of the tools that you could add to your toolkit to help engage industry more effectively? And I, I'll go through these in more detail. Um, I want to show how demonstrating the business case is absolutely critical. It's in their language. It's in their metrics. Compare them to their peers. They don't like to be down on the list when they're compared to their peers. They like to be at the top of the list. Catch them doing something right. Major. It's kind of think about that when you talk to your children. All right. Frame research a little bit differently. And then finally, understand their risks. So I'll go through these individually. And I'll start with the business case. And I don't need to run through a bunch of our slides that we've shared. It's in this little handout today. But these are the kind of things, this is the way you talk to them. You say, first of all, hey, lower calorie products are driving your sales growth. Hello, get with the program. All right, get with the program. If you don't jump on these kinds of better for you, lower calorie products, you're leaving money on the table. All right, same thing with this. You show companies that grew their lower calorie items, guess what? They grew. And the ones that didn't or ignored this, they actually overall declined. Overall company sales declined. The old traditional higher calorie products can't make up the difference anymore. They used to rely, their old model was sell whatever they can of all the old icon brands. Well, that's not working anymore for growth. And then again, this kind of thing, the stick rate, the shelf success. Lower calorie products are staying on the shelf more over five years compared to the higher calorie products. So again, get with the program. This is language they can understand. So this is what we mean by making the business case. As opposed to, you know, let's say we don't like sodas, we don't like chips, they're bad products, they're terrible, we have to get rid of them. Okay. I'm not even debating whether there's validity to that. The point is that doesn't move the needle. We're talking here about ways, devices to help you move the needle. And there are other ways to do it besides the core business case. There are best practices. We talked about that. More and more best practices, absolutely critical. Success stories, pilots, pilot programs. Remember we talked about our retailers before, that they're very traditional, very black and white, very to-do. They need pilots. They need their show-me. They are show-me. You don't go in and talk conceptually, hey, wouldn't it be nice to sell more products? It's good for your customer. No, no, no. Show me how it works in a store if I do displays or lower the price, whatever, that it'll be good for my business. Very important for that group. And, of course, track their progress. All right? Very important to track their progress. So, again, going back to the General Mills commitment, you know, they're up to 73% of their products that have improved their nutritional content compared to their 80% goal in a couple of years. So they might hit it, but at least they're tracking it. All right? Compared to their peers, there's a gold standard on this, and that's a J.D. Power survey of automobile initial quality. And this serves two purposes. One, it identifies, in essence, winners, the company, the car companies that are selling the best products in terms of quality. But what it also does is it's a bellwether to the consumer. It says, you know what? You buy these cars, you're going to have less problems with these cars. So it's a device to bring along the consumer. So again, we should consider things like this to do with food companies or other areas that you're interested in for public health. Catch them doing something right. This is one of my favorites. Uh, I think this was well done by the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation. Again, we've seen this, and this was publicized, but it was publicized, again, in tandem with Robert Wood Johnson, etc. But here's the important point about catch them doing right. We were in a conference with uh, ICCR, the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility. We had corporate folks in there, public health folks. We had people from academia. It was held at Columbia University. And I remember being in a session with some corporate people, Campbell, Kraft, uh, Nestle person was there. And finally, uh, one of the industry people said, look, every time we hear something, we're doing something wrong. 
just tell us when we do something right, at least acknowledge it. We know we have plenty of work to do. So, of course, the conclusion of the group, we had to come up with a conclusion is make food companies feel the love. Okay, they need to feel the love. All right, when they do something right, they're not, okay, call them on it. But when they do something well, it's important. And the reason it's important is because when you get down to the brand manager level, brands are their babies, whether they're healthier brands or perceived as not so healthy brands. They're still their babies. That's why they go to work in the morning. They live and breathe these products. You know, whether they should or not is moot. This is what they do. They live and breathe growing these businesses if you're the brand manager or the marketing director. So one of my favorite studies to point to is perhaps not to engage them. Here's a very credible group brand is, is top of the list. You've got U.S. A today with publicity and it says 96% of restaurant entrees exceed the limit. In other words, 96% of your babies are ugly. That's what the study says. All right, so think about this in terms of the way it hits. If we're thinking about getting industry to change, okay, and you just said basically you have to throw out 96% of your products. Well, so if I'm running a restaurant chain, I'm going, well, you don't leave me too many options here. You know, I can give away free water, okay, and do a couple things, but where's my option? Where's my option? So I, I don't have any dispute with the factual findings, but perhaps it's the way how we craft the findings in a way that it comes out to be constructive to industry, the people we're trying to move on this instead of one more time we don't like your products. We think they're terrible. So maybe we look at them and say, well, how many products are good for one of these items? Two, three, four, just to show and then track it over time. Once you track it over time, then you can show some progress. And then if they go the wrong way, now we have something to say. Now you have a basis for saying it. So again, I'm just trying to show you hurt their feelings with this stuff. We don't want to hurt feelings. Okay, fourth item. Frame research, and this goes back to a little bit of the discussion we just had with Wendy and Richard, and that is perhaps as studies are being designed, again, not with industry dictating how studies are designed, but to at least understand if a certain outcome occurs, what the intended or unintended consequence might be coming out of the research. And here's an example. The FTC has looked at marketing to children over the past few years. And they subpoenaed the records for 44 food companies. They did an analysis. And now you get these uh, figures. And, and I'm just trying to use this for illustrative purposes. So if you just look at the top figures here, you say, ah, carbonated soft drinks, CSD, are spending the most money to children. And breakfast cereals spending almost 30 percent of their dollars. So immediately you go to, oh my God, you know, this is exactly where the problem is. Well, to make impact with the business community, we need to overlay some additional analyses on this. One example, and this is for illustrative purposes only, if you know the percent of sales to children or the percent of profits they derive from kids' products, you create an index, divide the percent marketing, divided by percent sales. Now you have an index. What this would say in this example is, wait a minute, the highest number is restaurant foods. It says that they're overspending to children, okay, much more than they should be. Again, these are illustrative only, so it's not a, don't go running out now and <laughs> chase down a restaurant. This may be true, but the point is, these need to be overlaid in a way that they can understand. And then the third step would be, now what do you have to do about it? So if you're doing this, what are ways? You have to show them the pathway, how to get from what they're doing today, have them see the problem, and then show them a pathway so they can make a change that they can digest. And then finally, I want to run through the risks because these are important things to understand. Again, whether you agree or not, these are realities of what they're confronted with. Oftentimes, for instance, we talk about, well, let's just go introduce a bunch of new products, all right, make them healthier and just do it or change your products and take some salt out or sugars out, whatever. Well, let's go through what they're dealing with. The first thing is when you talk about new products, this is a, a painful proj 
process to go through as far as new products. All right, it starts with idea generation, consumer testing ad nauseum, test marketing, whatever, and it takes forever. So it's a long time frame and it does cost money. All right. The other aspect of this is that they may never see the money back because, as we'll show you, the failure rate's very high. So until the sales start going up like that red bell curve, they don't make any money. All right? And in fact, it may never get to that stage. So they're heavily invested. So they're looking at a decision, say, all right, if we have the next best thing to ever come out and it costs us 10 to $20 million to just get this ready and market it and introduce it, they have a risk of that turning into a goose egg. All right? So that is their risk. The other one is the high cost of marketing and promotion. And you're obviously familiar with advertising and promotional programs, slotting fees. In essence, they have to pay for their shelf and trade allowances. You know, this is money. Whenever you go into a supermarket and you see this kind of thing, guess what? They paid the grocer to have their product featured in this. So wherever you go, if it's displayed or the price is reduced, there was some money that went to a grocer. So again, they're trying to create, generate sales, but at the same time, it doesn't always work. And then the fifth point is very high level of failure. Okay, IRI, which is like Nielsen, has demonstrated up to 90% of new product items don't make it. And 80% of items only ever hit $7.5 million in sales. I mean, 20% only hit it. All right? And that may sound like a big number, but the point is these are multi-billion dollar companies. So $7.5 million in sales. You can't justify advertising a product with only $7.5 million in sales. Let's say you make 50% profit. That means you're only making $3.75 million on that, and you just can't do it. can't make any money on that. So this is why you see line extensions. It's easier to do grape Gatorade than it is to come out with your next best, healthiest new kids meal. Okay? Not saying that they shouldn't do it or even want to do it, but this is easy. You know what? I can't get fired for grape Gatorade. Even if it dies, I at least know I'll get six months on the shelf. And then in six months, I'll have mango-flavored Gatorade. And I'll slip it in there if the grape Gatorade isn't selling. It's easier. It's low risk. And remember, food industry is very risk-averse. They have the risk tolerance of a water utility. Okay? This is not a group that likes risk. Okay? So this is the easy path. And this is embedded in the DNA. So it's very difficult to get them out of this headset. So as we try to pull all this together today, there's a lot here and I know you know we crammed a lot into two hours today. You know, we really have to you can't solve the problem with the same thinking. All right. Einstein's been brilliant on this. It's almost like the definition of insanity is expecting a different result doing the same thing. He's brilliant in this space. So <coughs> We have to understand both sides of the equation to make ourselves more effective in this arena. And if I have to sum it up as you look to the corporate side, there's really two key elements to always keep in your toolkit. One is show up with the hard facts, hard facts, not opinion. And secondly, show the ramifications, the business ramifications if they don't change. Because what happens then, just like as they've learned with advertising, the principles behind advertising is generally the first ad doesn't, you know, thunks right off. It doesn't register. It takes multiple, they call it frequency, advertising frequency, where you have to see an advertisement or a message X number of times before it starts penetrating. You're kind of doing the same thing now. You're, you're bringing your awareness of the issues and it has to thunk through in a way that is not a Tower of Babel. It's in the language that they understand. And once they get there, then they can run through their thought process and be more constructive and productive with it. Again, it doesn't mean they're necessarily advocates for public health, but if we want them to change, we have to get them to the point where at least they're willing to change or at least they understand all the ramifications if they don't change. Very important thing. So building 
on this success and all the things we've gone through quickly today are collaborations are good. I, I think we're seeing some good track record for collaborations. Let's take the best ones that we've seen. Partnership for Healthy America, Healthy Weight Commitment, and know that they are win-wins and they have clear and measurable outcomes. They have deadlines. They're hard pledges. There's a lot of fodder in there to move forward with. Learn the metric motivators. And by metric, again, whether it's creating an index or doing JD Powers type things, those are in business language. So when you can extrapolate what you want, in other words, start with the end point. Start with the end point, what we're trying to change, and work backwards from the end point to put it in the language and the metrics that you have to show up with to persuade business to change. And then understand the risks. What I showed you very briefly through here is that these risks are real. They're not fake risks. They're real. They struggle under these risks. Again, whether we agree or not, they're real for them and they have to deal with them because think about when they go to work in the morning, they've put together a budget for 2015 right now that they're operating against and it says, okay, you will sell X cases of cake mix in uh, vanilla flavor and Y cases of Gatorade, whatever, and they have to hit those numbers. All right, that's, that's how their bonus is tied up. Now, I would argue that a bonus can and should be tied up with also introducing more better for your products. And actually, General Mills and uh, I believe Dan and are two companies that are now starting to do that, where with their R&D people and also some of their executives, where anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of their bonus is coming from them being successful, launching successful new better for you products because they the light bulbs has gone off and they said these products are better for us so we want to see more of these products. All right. Another thing is I've noticed is again because the minds are so fertile and full of ideas sometimes there's too many asks at the same time. I've been on some phone conversations with businesses uh, where the ask is, all right, we need you to change the way you're advertising to kids. We don't like the products you have. And we go on and on. And next thing you know, there's like four pages worth of asks. And the point is, I'd rather do one or two asks that are very clear what you want, quantified, and what the metric is. You'll make a lot more progress in that arena. You'll really make a lot of progress instead of doing it all. And then s stay focused on the ultimate goal. We're talking about improving the health of our kids. And go back to Ralph Waldo Emerson. We have to make this worth. It's not a nice little thing to say we're convening and all that. No, no, those days are over. We have to get together. We have to get constructive. We have to go together. There's going to be some things either side doesn't like, but it's called compromise, which Congress hasn't figured out yet, but nevertheless, it's necessary. Once we do this, we'll make the progress. And this is the bottom line. It's the bottom line for you in your metrics, but it's also the bottom line for society. So with that, I'd like to open it up to questions uh, from this group and also those in the live streaming. And uh, Wendy, if you can uh, stay around, maybe just in case there's any questions for you. I'm happy to answer them. Lawrence Williams from United States Health and Food Council. Uh, like you, Hank, I've spent most of my career on the industry side, not on the sort of public health side. So I definitely agree with you that, um, and I've always liked your work because it's helping biz businesses sort of showing them the way. And I firmly believe, as I believe you do, that in the only way to increase the consumption of health, more healthy products is to make them more profitable. Uh, if they're, they're not aligned with bottom, the bottom line, it's not going to work. Um, the only concern I have, and I think everybody's familiar with the old adage, to every complex question there is a simple solution, and it's wrong, <laughs> and nutrition is complex. Mm -hmm. And I agree that maybe having one ask might make sense, or two asks, but like the General Mills equation that you showed, it doesn't need to be one variable, like calories. And calories, mm -hmm. I think everybody in the room probably would agree, are a relevant measure, measuring stick, but probably not the only one we should be looking at. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And in fact, uh, one of the earlier charts, when we talk about what food industry can do, uh, that could be brought into, okay, more better for you products, as an example, or access, increase your access of 
better for you products by 20 percent over a five-year frame into food deserts or low-income areas those kind of things that's where it gets specific uh, my point on that, the ask, is just that I've seen the list where it's like oh, there's 17 things on this page and it's like there's no prayer. So what happens is they'll shut you down by the time you get to the third or the fourth ask. So that's my only concern. But I do agree with you. Make sure it's broad enough so that something substantial can be changed. Good point. Yes? Yeah, I just wondered, um, expanding on your knowledge of the food industry, um, how we might expect some of the improvements in the name brand, big industry um, products, you know, like Dr. Black mentioned that they have the resources to do R&D, that kind of thing, to move down into the store brands and the generics that are make up a larger share of the purchases of low-income consumers. <coughs> Yeah, great question. In fact, I'll have a specific answer for you when we announce some findings on supermarkets, uh, which is a collaboration we have with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, June 8th is the target date for that, and we'll be looking at um, availability of these products in uh, food deserts versus non, just to see if they're lagging or not. We'll also be looking at the products that contribute the most calories to children to see if progress has been made uh, selling fewer and fewer of those products. So we will be going through that at that point. Right. Uh, today I don't have an answer. We also will be looking at private label to see if private label has made progress. Our criteria is lower calorie products. So are they making progress in selling more and more lower calorie products or are they stagnating and not doing much? And we don't have that answer today, but June 8th you will. Uh, Wendy, I don't know if you had anything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, um, just a, a <coughs> kind of observation. And at this point in time, a lot of the public health measures are trying to change environment and policies. And at the moment, there seems to be a, a back to the concept of engagement um, and how important, um, I think, Wendy, you kept saying it, and so did Richard, about engaging in conversation. And it would be interesting to hear what your reflections are, because right now there's a couple. One is the dietary guidelines. Another one is the nutrition standards. Both of these, the nutrition standards in all the school meals, knowing how many meals are sold, if you're talking about a marketplace, um, that doesn't even have to require promotion or marketing it's just matter of supplying um, and so my question is sort of that's already happening and how is it that industry could be brought on to recognize that these changes because these are also happening in communities all throughout the nation in a broader mechanism how can industry start to embrace these more and recognize these are great marketplaces for their their healthier products that my question as well, um, do they consider institutional food service where the branding maybe is not as front and center mm -hmm. as the direct-to-consumer kinds of products, is that more of a laboratory where reformulation might be more accepted um, so that we have more opportunities to, to get products that meet nutrition guidelines which we're trying to implement not only in the regulated environment like schools and childcare, but in worksite cafeterias federal agency cafeterias, uh, state cafeterias, CDC has funding now to do that. And we, we feel that that's a market that could be available. We could make the business case that this is a market, but we're lacking on products which meet our specifications. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Lots of facets to that question. Uh, and I'm going to ask Wendy to join me momentarily. but. Let me, let me start with the institutional or the food service. If you're a packaged goods company, they tend to call that area food service. So that, that could be schools, it could be cafeterias, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's non-branded. Uh, it tends to be lower margin, lower profit margin, uh, but also at the same time they don't spend the marketing money against it, so it doesn't deplete the marketing budgets. Uh, interestingly, uh, historically they have underemphasize that side of their businesses. It, it's, not the, it's not the glamorous side of the companies. All right, so they, you see less and less effort going behind that. An interesting force to improve the quality of kids' foods, uh, let's say in schools, Sodexo, for instance, what they've done, big supplier of uh, food service meals, 
And they've worked together with a number of companies. So like uh, I can think of one with PepsiCo where they did some unique um, Tostito cup or Dorito cup and they created some you know, guacamole and salsa in there and it, it was healthier. It, it improved this, the nutrition of the products and they tested it with the kids and the kids loved it. So now it's gone into uh, it's available, excuse me, it's available everywhere that Sodexo is selling. So because that channel is important to a Sodexo or a Compass Foods or an ARA, they might be a more high-powered engine to drive that kind of consumption. I do think, though, that the manufacturers are a little, can be more asleep at the switch uh, on that channel. I mean, school's a little specific, and I, I'm going to ask for next Nestle perspective. But again, from the branded side, they put less emphasis on that. Nevertheless, to me, it's just a sea of opportunity. I mean, I, I've always said publicly, and it, it, I like the craft company, I have nothing against it, but the world needs, you know, let's do a healthy Lunchables. I mean, give me a break, guys. What a business opportunity. And if they don't do it, someone else will come over here with a smaller brand and do it. I mean, so you have those opportunities uh, to go into schools that could be packaged up and they have the same convenience factor and they don't have to be high in cost. So that's something that can be done out of the packaged goods company. So I think working in tandem with those two groups, Sodexo types and the packaged goods, I think are an avenue into, yes, do you just want to add on? Yeah. Oh no! And in fact, I, I think if Tracy uh, even mention, could mention some—I mean, some of the things that we've had discussions about. I mean, workplace wellness is an opportunity. Vending is run totally separately inside companies. A lot of the vending—it's basically a beverage and a snack um, initiative coming out of that. They have different people running that, so you have to go to them. There's no business case that's been developed yet there's been generally pressure. I mean, there's also a success story by the Clinton uh, Global Initiative on beverages in schools, now that 90% of the schools have converted over to, to lower the, the lower calorie beverages. So your broader question then is, all right, we have to look at all these facets. I mean, we're not even talking about restaurants now. For instance, I actually personally believe restaurants is the big oasis, or desert, I should say, that needs to come up to the next level. If, if the healthy weight companies account for 25% of the calories, the entire restaurant segment is about a third. Restaurants and food service are about a third of where the calories come from. So if you want to make your next big dent, that's the desert that we ought to be focused on. And that's its own set of dynamics there, its own set of different profit calculations. So you're asking about, they look at it this way. The world doesn't calculate their market share a better for you. What they do is if you sell yogurt, you get information on yogurt versus your competitor, and that's the world you live in. Okay? So it tends to be a little myopic. Okay? And again, if you're a brand manager, you're not even thinking about food service or even vending. Somebody over here gets vending machines out there. So each one of these needs its own tactic to go after and will have its own metric to look at the outcome. There's, there's no broad metric on this. Yeah, they want to make more profit, but a uh, classic example from several years ago in uh, Minneapolis suburb uh, was an early experiment to pull out the sodas. They left one soda machine in a junior high and they added 13 machines which were mostly water and other things. And lo and behold, they learned, oh, we can sell more stuff. We're not, we're selling hardly any soda, but we make more money. We made, they made $4,000 more per school in that system. So again, you have to get down to their particular metric that they look at and evaluate, but it's there. It's just putting the resources. You know, my, my proclivity, and sometimes maybe too much so, is, is I zero in on where I think I get the biggest hit first because I want to see the success. So packaged goods, I see them 
Supermarkets will come after this next study I mentioned, uh, the Robert Wood Johnson study. And supermarkets will come faster than restaurants because they have consumer packaged goods pressure because that's where they sell most of their products. Then the restaurants will come after them, but I still think they need a lot of heat on them. So again, you have to take all, the, it's like a big puzzle, each one of them with their own metrics. Thank you for a very good and complicated question. I hope I at least got down to one or two conclusions. All right, any other questions at this point? Um, just want to finally show you we've had our recent successes, barriers, and progress session today. We have three hot issue sessions coming up in May, October, and December, and we'll be picking some real hot button issues and use those issues as the means to show how we come at them. And then, as I mentioned, we're also going to have one for industry, and we'll be coming to you to solicit feedback for that. So thank you, everybody, for coming today. Thank you all at the live stream. We appreciate it. We are always available for, to answer any questions, and thank you so much for coming.